Chris Wiley, hello. Hi. Nice to have you here. Cheers, thanks for having me. Your book, Mindfuck, is out now. What's it about? It's a sort of story about my journey from um, starting at a British military contractor called SCL Group, uh, where I was working in an area uh, called information operations. We were looking at um, you know, what are the things that, uh, for example, make people um, more vulnerable to uh, extremist ideologies and being recruited and being manipulated, um, originally for uh, military clients, um, to getting that work uh, completely inverted um, after, you know, our company got acquired by an alt-right billionaire um, and where Steve Bannon, before he was the Steve Bannon, um, became my boss and uh, what that was like. Um, and then, you know, watching, you know, work that we were that we were originally doing for the security of democracies like America or Britain, you know, be flipped on its heads. And rather than trying to mitigate um, extremism, catalyzing extremism in the United States uh, for Steve Bannon's alt-right. And, you know, from that uh, going and blowing the whistle on it and, you know, telling the world about it. What's he like as a boss? Uh, he's kind of a dick. Um, when I first met him, um, I actually really enjoyed talking to him, but that was before he became my boss. And again, this was before he became like the Steve Bannon. Um, so he was just some guy from America who was interested in the work that we were doing. Um, a little bit weird, um, but so am I. And like when you work in information operations for like military clients, you meet a lot of kind of weird people. So, you know, the first conversation that I had with him, like ranged from like, um, like large sort of online video games and like poning people to like intersectional feminism and everything sort of in between. So it was, he was actually a really cool guy to talk to. He knows lots about lots of things. Um, but you know, after he got put in charge of the company, after it got acquired and he became like, Steve Bannon, the boss, like kind of, you know, a massive dick to, to work for. Um, you know, he has a temper. He looks at you as sort of an extension of himself. So if you, if you go, no, I'd, or, you know, I don't want to do that, or that seems kind of fucked up, um, you know, he's, he gets upset. How does, you know, self-described a, a gay vegan Canadian, you're not your typical right-wing populist. How do you end up at the sharp end of Bannon's digital information operation? Yeah, um, you know, th when I first joined um, the company that eventually became Cambridge Analytica, um, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, Steve Bannon wasn't even in the picture. Um, I didn't even know who Steve Bannon was. Mm -hmm. I think most people actually didn't know who Steve Bannon was. Um, and it was, it was actually after um, working for uh, Nick Clegg and the Lib Dems for two years um, and kind of getting sick of that. Um, so, cause that went over so well. Um, then I actually got introduced um, from a colleague from the Lib Dems to this company, SCL Group, which is a military contractor. And, um, you know, I thought, okay, cool, like I could, you know, never thinking that somebody kind of like me could work in like national security type stuff. Um, but they were looking for a research director who was interested in A, like data science and modeling and also B, like behavior and identity and ideology and all that. And that's what I'd been doing previously working in politics. So I thought, okay, cool. Like that seems interesting and niche, but okay. Um, and the first, uh, you know, sets of projects that, um, you know, I started working on uh, with others at the company, we're looking at, you know, what, uh, you know, what can, can we do looking at, you know, all this data that exists on the internet to identify people who are, or could be more, more likely to be manipulated or more likely to be a susceptible target of extreme 
extremist groups looking to recruit people and radicalize people. Um, and so spending time studying that and looking at, you know, what is the, what is the journey that somebody goes through in that process of radicalization and what makes them unique and more vulnerable to that kind of radicalization compared to um, their peers. So we looked at a lot of what the military called YUMs, young unmarried men. And young unmarried men uh, with sort of particular kinds of psychological attributes. And the way we were able to sort of identify that is through looking at social data um, as well as other data sets. But, you know, when you, when you think about all the things that you sort of say and do online, um, you know, people curate themselves, right? And so we were able to look at sort of building um, algorithms that looked for relationships between certain kinds of attributes in a person that would make them possibly a target or possibly more prone to being radicalized, and th th their sort of wider behavior online. And, uh, you know, that was interesting work. Um, and, you know, Steve Bannon sort of came into sort of my world um, because one of our clients, who at the time was working for the US Air Force, just randomly was sitting on a plane with um, two political strategists who were working for the Tea Party, which later sort of became what we now call the alt-right. And, um, you know, how Americans are, just chit-chat nonstop. So it's like, oh, hey, we're like on a plane together, so like tell me what you do, because I'm going to tell you what I do, right? Um, and so uh, these strategists talked with, you know, our, one of our clients who's working at the U.S. Air Force at the time in like information operations, psychological operations, um, cyber defenses. And, um, you know, he then introduced um, these people who worked for Steve Bannon to my boss at the time. And so my boss at the time flew over to New York and met this guy, Steve Bannon, who was uh, running a website called Breitbart which is a very sort of right-wing uh, website, when he took over Breitbart, um, after Andrew Breitbart died, uh, who founded it, um, he wanted to you know, it, it sort of live up to the vision that Andrew Breitbart had, which is that politics exists downstream from culture. So if you want to make an impact uh, in changing society, don't focus on the day-to-day -day arguments in the news, focus on changing culture. Um, but the problem with Breitbart is that it became sort of this like glorified hate blog for straight white dudes who can't get laid. And, and I don't say that flippantly. When you look at what's called the incel community, involuntary celibates, it's actually a part of the alt-right. But Steve saw that he, that his sort of brands of right-wing populism that was sort of um, being spouted off on, on Breitbart was, pop was popular amongst these, like, young, unmarried men who, you know, were struggling economically, like, struggling romantically, couldn't get laid. This was literally, when you look at, um, you know, why uh, so many of these sort of alt-right supporters have these really, like, extreme anti-feminist views, they sort of look at like women's empowerment as this thing that's preventing them from like sort of living the life that their father had, um, this sort of loss of privilege as sort of a, a, a victimization of, of, of their life. And when he heard that, you know, there was a team in London that was doing research on these another group of young unmarried men, but who had some very similar kinds of experiences and attributes that interested him. And he uh, met me and he met several other people in London um, and convinced a billionaire to acquire us um, and acquire the IP. And the reason for that was because a lot of the research that we were doing um, you know, was for different military clients. 
And if you're doing research for the military, you can't just sell it willy-nilly. Like if you work at BAE Systems and you're doing like weapons research, you can't just sell a missile to someone, you know, unless they're Saudi. And so in order to access the research that we were doing, they decided to acquire the company and pull out the IP and plop it into the United States where we are looking at these same kinds of like young unmarried men more prone to paranoid ideation but rather than to figure out ways to mitigate you know th that process of radicalization what he wanted to do was to catalyze a process of radicalization and i think one of the things that i talk about in the book is like when you're looking at the alt right um you know people often, whether it's in Britain or whether it's in America, people kind of talk about it in like as if it's a political movement. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's an insurgency. It works more like a cult than anything else, which is why we get into these weird debates about like, is something real or not? Because, that, and that's not an ideology. That's, that's like a cult. And that's kind of what Steve's vision was to create. And the role of Cambridge Analytica was essentially to manipulate people, to identify people and then manipulate them online. There's an emotion I feel that runs through that, which is one of humiliation, yes. I think. Yeah. But in terms of, I'm sure there's all sorts of different indicators, but could you give an example of maybe a clue or something that you might look for, something that perhaps someone had liked or engaged with on Facebook that would perhaps be an example that might indicate someone yeah. is one of these people? So when you think about, when you think about, um, Facebook pages and liking Facebook pages, right? You can, you know, like things that, you know, it, you can like a brand, you can like a celebrity, you can like a musician, but you can also like like things that are phrases or, you know, sort of a, a slogan or, you know, so for example, one that I remember um, that um, uh, in a report showed that it produced uh, quite a bit of signal in its, in its predictive value was, I hate it when my parents look at who I'm texting. There, there's like, and so somebody liking that page, like it's not, it's just a page and you like it because you're like, yeah, I hate it when like people like look at, you know, when my parents are like trying to find out what I'm doing. And then when you looked at the, the comments on this page, it's all people who are sort of annoyed or like, and, and one of the things that we found was that was one of many, many, many other kinds of likes that were more related to um, neuroticism which is a personality trait. So that's not to say if you like that one page, all of a sudden you're going to be like a radical jihadist, for example, or a radical alt-right, you know, psycho. But it's one clue of many, 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 many um, in context that if you're an algorithm and you're sniffing around all this data and you go, okay, so, you know, this, this person likes all these things. And I know from my past experience that these are things that are related to the type of profile that I'm looking for. Bingo, he's a target. And those people who would be uh, processed into a, a, what's called a target universe, um, where their records would be identified for, you know, ads. Um, you know, imagine all of a sudden you're, you're, you're this person. You don't know that this is happening, right? And so you're just like sitting, whatever, in your bedroom and it's like 1 a.m. and you're just like fucking around on the internet. And so you go onto your Facebook page and you see like an ad, right? And when you're sitting like in your bedroom looking at that ad, it doesn't seem like there's like an intention behind it, right? It's just like a thing that seems kind of random. You go on Facebook, you see ads. It's just the one that you see, but you click on it. And, you know, all of a sudden you start reading about things that like feel intuitive to you, right? So you don't realize that you might have been targeted because you have particular attributes, which you may or may not be aware of yourself, that make you more prone to believing certain things. And so you, you see... Conspiracy theories. You see more prone to paranoid ideation, conspiratorial thinking, more neurotic, right? So if you're the type of person that, like, gets angry easily, you know, or the type of person that um, kind of jumps to conclusions a lot and feels like someone's out to, you know, that takes offense easily or that some, that you're, you're, that someone's out to kind of fuck around with you. Or that like you look at all of, all of these other people who are being more successful than you, that have more opportunities than you, 
and you're like still stuck like in your parents' basement or whatever, right? And you kind of resent that. You're, it's not to say that at that moment you are a radical, right? But at that moment, you, there's several opportunities or openings for somebody who wants to radicalize you to start to, to manipulate you. And so, you know, all of a sudden this person, they, they join a Facebook page or a group and all of a sudden they start getting messages from people or they start chatting with people. Links are sharing, they're, they're clicking on stuff and they're seeing all these things that they hadn't seen before but like make sense to them. Like that th there's this deep state and like it's, you know, connected with the media and like there's this like grand conspiracy of people and it's related to George Soros and like you go down this rabbit hole of like, did you know this or did you know that or these people are connected to that and like that's why your life sucks because these people are trying to keep you down because they can only stay up if you're kept down, right? And you're, you're like ready for somebody to explain why you hate your life. And all of a sudden, you're chatting with people that just make sense. Finally, someone's articulating and helping me articulate this like kind of pent up frustration that I have. And they're giving me a way to rationalize and understand it. And when these groups would get to a certain sort of threshold in popularity, um, you know, the, the, the company uh, would, you know, invite them to events, right? So, and even if like five to 10% five to of people um, showed up to an actual event in this county or that county, right? You might have like 50 people flooding a coffee shop. And then all of a sudden, like you've got, you, you, this fantasy that you've sort of been fiddling around with in your bedroom on your computer, all of a sudden becomes very tangible and real because you are now somewhere face to face with people who look like you, sound like you, talk about stuff that you think is true, and they don't have an agenda because they're just like you, people who are kind of pissed off, people who are concerned about what's happening, and like this person might also be like an unemployed young white male like you. They might be an electrician. They might be a teacher. But the thing that they all have in common is that they don't, in your eyes, have an agenda because no one's made them come here, right? They're not trying to sell you anything, right? But at that, at that point, you don't realize that the reason you're there the reason why you clicked on that page in the first place and the reason why you're all talking about the same narrative is because there's a group of people who have literally targeted you, identified you, and tried to can get you to continue, continuously engage with these narratives that they're sharing with you. And that this thing that feels random isn't. And you don't realize that. And because you don't realize that, you perhaps decide to join this movement. Um, this movement of people. And also, when they start talking about all these things, that you, when you, when you go and you turn on CNN, or you turn on BBC Newsnight, or you read a newspaper, and you don't see all of these things, it's because they've got the agenda. The people that I'm talking to who don't have an agenda, this guy's like an electrician. Like, what does he have to gain by telling me all these things, right? He's just like, he's just like my neighbor. Like, he's just like me. But these people over here, they're trying to make money, they're trying to exploit people like me, they're trying to keep people down like me because they've got an agenda. And it's at that point that you become isolated. You stop trusting institutions that are like super vital for keeping citizens informed and you start engaging solely in this like mutual conspiracy that everybody is like constantly talking about and you just spiral deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into this. And then you start talking to your friends about it. And then you start talking to people and you start recruiting. You might join more events, right? And you might actually start organizing. And hey ho, you're now part of like an alt-right movement and you don't realize it. And this is how insurgencies get built. This is the same way that, you know, an, an extremist organization like ISIS recruited people here, right? Stop listening to the news. Stop talking to your parents. Stop listening to your imam because they've all got an agenda. I'm telling you the truth and they're not, right? And at that point, you're isolated. You start to isolate yourself and it's at that point where, like, 
you are now living in someone else's vision and someone else's vision becomes your reality. So the Facebook quizzes have been taken. Yeah. The data has been harvested. Your friend's data has been harvested. Yeah. Cambridge Analytica ha has psychological profiles of millions of people. Yeah. At what point did you personally become concerned about the legality of what they were doing? Yeah. So, you know, the, the people, people would use these quizzes like left, right and center, you know, it'd be because they wouldn't seem like they're profiling you. Right. It'd be like, um, like do this like quiz and find out who like which Game of Thrones character are you? Right. You know, or like which Disney princess are you, you know, like things like that where people like it doesn't seem like there's like some kind of nefarious like alt right agenda behind it. But there is. And, you know, at that point. So I think. For me. You know, when you're sitting at a computer and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you're getting instructions to start doing things that. You. You you originally started working, you originally start working on a project to, um, to counteract or mitigate radicalization. And all of a sudden, somebody else is telling you now to take that know-how and that knowledge and like invert it. And a lot of people originally kind of was like, okay, this is some weird experiment, whatever. Steve Bannon is kind of like this weird guy. He's got his weird ideas, but like he's now the boss man, right? And, you know, if you don't like it, it's like if all of a sudden you've got new owners, a new board, it's not like you can go to like your HR department and be like, mm, can I put on my record that I disagree with like the entire direction of this company and like I think what we're doing is like illegal and, you know. For me, where it really hit home, though, was after a couple months looking at these projects and seeing the outcome. So when you're sitting at a computer and you're looking at records, right, and you're typing some code in Python and you're looking for relationships between attribute X and attribute Y, right, it feels very remote. Like, you don't feel like you're doing anything to people it's because a it's, a, it's, a, it's a file. Like, you're just, you're accessing a file. Right. And so it doesn't feel like you're doing something to anyone um, in the same way that I suspect people who do weapons research don't feel like they're doing anything to anybody. Right. You know, it's like I'm just looking at chemistry. I'm not, you know, actually killing people. Right. So but it was watching videos of people who had been put into this target universe a couple months ago, who had been walked through this process of manipulation to the point where they're on camera in a focus group or on an event filled with rage about stuff that for them is so obvious and so true, but sitting and watching it, you know, in your office in London going, you were fed that. Somebody in this office decided that this is a narrative that you would engage with and that you would get angry about. And now you are. And the thing that you're absolutely convinced uh, that's real. This conspiracy and, you know, the reason why, like, CNN is not talking about it or BBC is not talking about it is because they've got some weird agenda and this is the truth. You don't realize that, like, actually, your truth is somebody else's agenda. And seeing that, you know, and, and just looking at people who, who now live in a world that's not real was, like, really fucked up. You know, it, it, because what I saw was exactly what a lot of people on our team, including myself, set out to work against, radicalization. And I kind of didn't really see the difference between what Steve Bannon wanted to do in the United States and ISIS, because these were people who were talking about, like, race realism and a purer America and, you know, like their entitlements as like the, you know, true inheritors of like the glory of America. Stuff that sounded really fucked up, but, and, and you could swap out some words, you know, and you would get some kind of narrative from another extremist group from somewhere else. And I sort of watched that and I thought like, I can't do this. This is like, there's no way for me to justify working on this. Like, I, I see absolutely no value in continuing to do this. 
And so I left. When I started hearing Donald Trump say things, words and phrases that I had seen in our testing, um, I had seen in, in experiments that Cambridge Analytica was doing, um, things that people were laughing at, you know, like build the wall, right? The things that people were like, this is so stupid. Why is this guy, you know, um, when he's talking about the deep state, you know, drain the swamp, all of these things. And I'm like hearing all of these, these words and it's just triggering me. And so I then did uh, go back to the United States. I talked to people who I knew um, from American politics, some of whom were working for the Obama administration. And I was telling, I told them like, you know, there's some really screwed up stuff that's going on in this company on the on the Trump campaign. You know, they've done all this, they've harvested all this data, they have a campaign of manipulation. Like they have all these weird psychologists, some of whom are like going to Russia and like doing these presentations in Russia and St. Petersburg about like how to profile and target American voters. And so, you know, I then say this to people who were working at the administration at the time in 2016. And the response that I got was like, yeah, well, it, it's no, like Donald Trump is a sketchy guy, you know, or, you know, Donald Trump is a shady guy, as they would say in Britain. And, but like Hillary Clinton's going to win. And if we are seen as somehow like interfering in the election, like th there could be chaos that results from that because God forbid somebody interferes in the U.S. election. And so I didn't, you know, at that point I was like, okay, well, like you're working in the government, like you probably know more about this than I do. And maybe I'm kind of a bit, like it does kind of sound a little bit conspiratorial. Maybe I'm the conspiratorial one. Um, but, you know, there were like real links that the company had um, to Russia. Russia popped up everywhere. Um, you know, the psychologists that were working on this project also had uh, work in St. Petersburg. It was state-funded research in St. Petersburg looking at um, psychological profiling of people online, particularly looking at trolling behavior, where you'd have these same, these same psychologists go to Russia, give presentations on the work that the company was doing, tell people about the access that this company had to like tens of millions of people's private Facebook records and how that was being used and how that's useful in targeting people in American politics. And then having, you know, Russian executives from big companies come, like an oil company, a Russian oil company coming and saying, tell us about the data that you have on American voters. You know, and then sitting there listening to people like in Cambridge Analytica, just telling this like Russian oil company, like, oh yeah, we've got this and that. Do you want to see this? Look at this, look at this, give us money. And, you know, sitting and going, wait, why does a Russian oil company like want data on American citizens? Having some of the, um, the briefings that I had previously written on like our, uh, our algorithms and our, our data being sent to a personal friend of Vladimir Putin you know, where some of the people that we then hired, some of their business partners were ex-GRU uh, officers, GRU being like a Russian intelligence agency, you know, who then worked on projects um, in the United States where Americans' attitudes towards the leadership style of Vladimir Putin and Russia's claims to Crimea were then tested by projects that were being managed by people whose business partners were former Russian intelligence officers whose other clients were pro-Russian political parties in the Ukraine. And I found all of this slightly bizarre. This was before the narrative of sort of Russian interference came to, came to sort of public consciousness. But even after like um, you know, I, I blew the whistle, still, you know, gathering evidence. People would give me stuff, for example. And, you know, one of the things that I then found out was that some of Cambridge Analytica's clients um, in Britain 
who, you know, either managed or donated, you know, some of the largest donors to um, pro-Brexit campaigns in Britain, before, during, and after the referendum campaign, were regularly meeting with the Russian ambassador, um, where you had donors to Brexit campaigns inviting officials from the Russian embassy to, like, the victory party, where when one of their colleagues gets arrested in the Chicago airport after leaving a Trump rally on their way back to London, them getting the charge sheets from these federal agents and then emailing them to the Russian embassy. Like, and these were people who were like funding Brexit. S clients of Cambridge Analytica, friends of Steve Bannon. And what were they doing in the United States? They were meeting with Donald Trump. So, you know, taking a step back and you look at it and you're like, this kind of looks like a conspiracy. I, you know, it, it's, it's a dirty word because it implies that you're a little bit cry. But when I look at it and I go, you've got Steve Bannon's company, like hiring people who now have been indicted in the Mueller investigation, whose business partners were former Russian intelligence officers, where memos in the company you know, talked about how they would use and access teams of former Russian intelligence officers for hacking political opponents, for example, where psychologists from the company would then give briefings in St. Petersburg about how you can use data to either catalyze trolling behavior or B, target American voters, right? Like, and then some of their clients during Brexit were then meeting with the Russian ambassador and then meeting with Donald Trump. And I looked at that and I was just like, like, I don't know what you call that, but it's like pretty fucking suspicious, you know? And it was really interesting because when I took, and, and this is not me just like saying it, right? Like the thing, when, when I put together evidence, I had emails text messages, screenshots, like documents, memos. Like it wasn't just like a he said, she said type scenario. It's like there was like actual documentation of it. You know, when my lawyers looked through it, you know, the, you know they talked with the National Crime Agency, which is like Britain's FBI, um, also MI5. In Britain, the authorities kind of looked at it and sort of didn't do anything with, with that aspect of it. You know, when you, when you present like law enforcement with evidence, that, it, it, at least um, circumstantial evidence that would warrant reasonable suspicion, which is a, a threshold for investigation. But it's about like this really controversial thing, Brexit. Um, and, you know, also, your boss's 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 boss doesn't really want this investigated. Theresa May, when she was prime minister, refused to answer in parliament whether or not she was involved in slowing down or preventing an investigation into Russian interference during Brexit. When I went to the United States and I met with um, Adam Schiff, who's the ranking uh, Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, and had um, several hearings, uh, closed hearings, with the House Intelligence Committee and also several American uh, law enforcement and intelligence agencies, this was like, of this was a focal point of discussion because you had some personal friends of Donald Trump who were also funding Brexit and people who worked with Steve Bannon who were also funding Brexit involved in at least regular communication with like the Russian government. Not like they met somebody who was once friends with somebody who like lived in Moscow once and like knew somebody who might've been a spy. Like literally face to face talking with the Russian ambassador in between going back and forth to the United States and also whilst Brexit was happening. Seemed suspicious. But in, but in Britain, when you, so in Britain when you talk about Russian interference, when it comes to Trump, you know, that's, that's an accepted thing, right? It's like, oh yeah, like Russia's everywhere. You start talking about it with Brexit and then you're like in the loony bin. But what's weird about it is like, actually there's more tangible evidence of, you know, Russian interference or at least Russian interest <laughs> um, 
in pro-Brexit campaigns uh, than there is actually on the, on the Trump campaign. And, you know, the thing that, that I'd say is, like, when you, you, you look at what's happened with the journalist Carol Cadwallader, right, and you look at, you know, uh, how, you know, a, a, an award-winning journalist at The Guardian, you know, who worked, you know, in partnership with The New York Times, presents this, you know, these are not, like, you know, tabloid papers, rigorous fact-checking processes, and just the sort of misogynistic abuse that she had, um, where she's labeled and branded as like a crazy cat lady, like literally as a crazy cat lady. Um, and then all of a sudden people don't take it seriously anymore. And I, I am convinced that if, you know, Carol was not a woman, if Carol was a man, and presented the same, exact same evidence, it would, be, it would be discussed on the BBC, whereas it currently isn't. Carol obviously is the journalist who broke your story originally, yeah. the, the original scoop, if you like. Yeah. Do you think it's possible for the UK to hold a free and fair election referendum democratic exercise right now? Well, right now, no, because, you know, let, let's look at some facts, right? When you look at the referendum, 40% of vote leave spending, you know, went to Cambridge Analytica subsidiary which had the same access to, to, to data and the same kinds of capabilities that I was just talking about. It just had a different name. Where the money that was used was declared by the Electoral Commission as unlawful. Where Vote Leave conceded that it was unlawful, conceded that they cheated in the referendum, paid uh, fines and penalties for that. Where you have a vote that also, um, you know, is super close, right? It wasn't like Brexit was won by a super wide margin. And there is a, a, a proven, you know, where the referendum was won, where the campaign that won the referendum was cheating, and that's not an allegation, that's a finding of fact. And the, the really bizarre thing about it is that if, like, I feel like when you look at the Olympics, for example, right, and if you're caught doping, right, if you've got somebody and they won the gold medal and they've, they've later turns out that they've cheated, they've taken some dose of, you know, whatever, some banned substance, right, they lose their medal. You don't get into a discussion about, well, they're a really good athlete, well, they won anyway, did it really make a difference, like you know, the race is over, let's just move on, let's move on to the next Olympics, you know, why are you constantly reliving or trying to refight this race? That would be, no, you lose, you lose your medal, you might get disqualified, um, and it's because in order for a race to have meaning, you need to have integrity in the rules, you have to enforce the rules. When you cheat on an exam, right, you gotta fail. You don't get the professor going, oh, well, you would have gotten an A anyway, so like, we'll just let it slide, right? You, at best, you get to retake it. If you're lucky, you get to retake it, right? And so when I look at the, when I look at the referendum and I go, there is proven instances of systemic cheating, right? 40% of vote leaves uh, declared spending went to a Cambridge Analytica subsidiary. Right? That's no. That's not a. That's not a niche thing. That's not a small number. That's like four, almost half of their budget, like of their entire campaign budget, went to a Cambridge Analytica subsidiary, and a bunch of that money was declared to be unlawful. So you've got proven cheating with unlawful money funding a Cambridge Analytica subsidiary to win Brexit, and you know, unlike uh, the Olympics where the stakes are like somebody's gold medal or you know, uh, uh, an exam where the stakes are like whether somebody gets a fail or not, right? The stakes for Britain are an irreversible change to the constitutional settlements of a country. You can't undo Brexit. Like, the, it, a profound change to the foundational law of a country. And for me, I just go, we are embarking on changing the foundational law of this country where law breaking was used in order to win. And what does it mean for like the rule of law of a country where if you successfully break the law, 
and get away with it. And that allows you to change the foundational law of a country. Like, does law have meaning at that point? Like, what, like, surely that's a consequence that should, people should be outraged about, you know? And the problem is that it's, you know, people, as soon as you, as soon as you start talking about, you know, was the referendum won fairly, right? What, is there validity to this result? You get cast as some Ramoner. Right? It's like, oh, you're just a Ramona. You're just, you're just whinging because you didn't win. And I'm like, I'm not saying like we shouldn't have Brexit or not. What I'm saying is like, if we go down the path of like really profoundly changing the, the what this country is, right, leaving the European Union, irreversibly changing the constitutional settlement of this country, that surely it should be reasonable to ask, like, was it won fairly? And are we confident in the result? And I, I look at it and I go, if, if British people looked at the same set of facts, uh, you know, the same set of facts in Zimbabwe, right? Or in Nicaragua. Trinidad. Know, or Trinidad, wherever. And then we're asked the question, should there be a rerun of that referendum or of that election when you had proven systemic cheating uh, in that process? Probably people would be like, yeah, there should be a rerun of that, that, that referendum. But as soon as it comes to Brexit, it's like, no, you're just remoting. And I, the thing that I learned, because I'm, so I'm an immigrant to this country. I'm from Canada originally, and I moved here. And, you know, this is, for me, I look at Britain and, like, the notion of fair play is, like, a very British value. Like, British people pride themselves, you know, standing in a queue. Like, standing in a queue for the cash point is, like, literally part of British culture, right? You know, being polite, following the rules, being reasonable, right? Very British values. Like, and, I, and I, I'm coming here as an immigrant and I go, one of the things that I thought made Britain Britain was like respect for rules and that, and that, you know, the rules are there and if you follow them, you have a fair society. But when it comes to like an election, that just goes out the window when it comes to a referendum that goes out the window and for me that's just like surely of in of anything that we care about rules right like it should be our elections there should be consequences for breaking the rules in an election but currently there isn't you have people who were involved in managing the largest breach of campaign finance law in british history in downing street both when Theresa May was Prime Minister and now with Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. You have people who are managing a campaign that broke the law in a very large way that are now managing the Brexit process. And I find that offensive. How, you touched on this earlier actually, but how powerful do you think nostalgia is? Oh, well, in Britain, particularly powerful. I mean, the, uh, coming from a different country, you really sort of see some of the blind spots of like British people. And I say that I love British people. So I say this sort of in a caring way, but like, you know, British people when they're in school, they don't really learn about like colonial history. They don't learn about like the atrocities that Britain committed around the world. They, they kind of um, avoid the part of history from like, you know, not the end of the war to sort of, you know, the 60s where you had a substantial decline in the influence of, you know, British foreign policy. And, you know, when people, and also people kind of forget, like, you know, nostalgia for what? Like, the 70s kind of sucked for Britain. You know, it's like, wh wh where are we harking back to? Like, you know, how far back are we going to? Oh, when Britain was great. Okay, great for who? Right? Like, gr sure. If you were in, you know, London in the 1850s and you were like a white British dude, life was grand. But, you know, if you were in India, you know, if you were in the colonies, life kind of sucked, right? And a, 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 a lack of recognition that Britain, when you look, okay, at all the things that are like the most, when you look at the most British things about Britain, right? Okay, the national drink is tea, right? You don't make tea in England, right? It's from Asia, right? The national animal is a lion from Africa. You know, people's favorite food is like a curry, 
right? Like, Britain kind of doesn't realize that, like, the most British things about Britain are, like, not from here. They're from elsewhere. And I think there's, like, in part a collective ignorance about, like, actually what is this country and who made this country. Um, and, you know, th that this country was built in large part by people of color. Whether we like it or not, it was. Just because you can't see them, just because they're somewhere else, doesn't mean that they didn't help build this country, right? And, you know, when you look at um, what happens in, in, in Brexit, I think also, and I, I describe this in the book a bit, I look at Brexit and, and, the, and the referendum as like a bar fight. So if you've got somebody, right, who is angry and they're like pent up and they're just, they're, just, they're just ready to let it out, right? And you have a lot of people like that in Britain because of, you know, underfunding of the education system, opportunities for people. Like, you know, there are some pretty terrible uh, council states around this country. Huge wealth inequality. Total. Like... You know, this is an unfair country, and like the class system still really inhibits people from succeeding, particularly outside of like wealthy areas, you know, in London, for example. And you've got people who kind of like are really frustrated with their lives, right? And it's like when you have a friend who goes to a bar and they have had like a shit week and they're really pissed off. I don't know, maybe they had a breakup or like their boss, they got fired or something happens and they're just fucking pissed off, right? And somebody says some smart ass comment or something to them and they just flip, right? At that moment in time, if you're going to calm down the situation, right? You don't go, if you punch them, there's going to be consequences. There's going to be terrible consequences. Like, you're gonna lose your opportunities, things are gonna be terrible, like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, what's gonna happen? They've already been punched in the face. They're gonna do it. <laughs> so when you look at like the Remain campaign, one of the things that I found so like irritating about it is that a campaign that's run by people who are like in Shoreditch, in London, you know, it's like people who, have really do benefit from the European Union. When you live in 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 London, you have access. You meet cool people from all around Europe. You know you like can go and see cool cultural things. You sit in a position of privilege. It's easy for you to go. Why on earth would we want to change this? Right? Look at how amazing everything has become. But if you have somebody you know like George Osborne going around the country going. The economy is going to suffer, guys. Don't do it. It's going to be bad. It's going to be really bad. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Right? It's literally like yelling at the person in the bar, don't do it. Because it's not recognizing like, hey, I know that you're really upset right now. Right? I know that things kind of suck right now. Like, let's try to calm this, let's calm this shit down. Right? You, you don't egg them on. And I feel like when George Osborne went around the country, right, and you had remain, and they still do it now, you know, constantly talking about like, but the economy is going to, crash, everything's going to be terrible. You know what? If you haven't had a job in two years, you don't give a fuck about the economy because the economy hasn't helped you at all in your life, right? You don't care if you're poor and you're in the north of England, you don't care about freedom of movement because you can't, you can't even imagine, you know, spending six months in Spain, right? You can't afford a train to London. You can't afford a fucking train to London. So like the, the way I, I feel like even, even for progressives who like to talk about how much they care about people and opportunities and fairness in this country, like, really need to check themselves about, like, the, just, like, the latent classism and the latent privilege that's embedded in the way they even talk about the referendum or Brexit. And, you know, when you look at how Cambridge Analytica, for example, targeted people, right, they looked for people who were in situations where they were ready to be angry, right? And when you've got, you know, a campaign like Vote Leave that used a Cambridge Analytica subsidiary to identify the people who are, like, ready to be angry and ready to find a reason to be angry about, um, I, I feel like a lot of people on the Remain side just really don't understand what happens.
And they still don't. Because we still have these discussions about like, oh, everything's going to be terrible. And it's like, but the people who are like out, you know, supporting Brexit, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, there's a cohort of people, they're, they're supporting it because like they're angry. They're just really angry. And until Britain starts to address some of this the, and, and have a frank and open conversation about like, this is not a fair country. Class is like very real in this place, right? This is a racist country, like it or not, it is. You know, people of color have been systemically abused by the society for like centuries. We don't recognize that all the things that are like cool and great about Britain, like are, had contributions from people from outside of Britain. Uh, every time you drink tea, like it wasn't an English person that grew that. Um, and I, I feel like, <sighs> Brexit is this sort of unfortunate, like, you know, the, 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 sort of the, this apex of, like, like disregard and ignorance about, like, so many things um, that on the Leave side, I feel like they sort of bizarrely were more aware of some of these things than, than the Remain side, despite Remain's sort of like self-concept of, like, being the ones that care about people. I wonder... If you could have a conversation with Mark Zuckerberg right now, what it is that you would say to him? Like, what the fuck? Like, actually, what the fuck? Like, you're so rich. Like, your company is so profitable. And why is it that you're so resistant to, like, fairly reasonable criticism about, like, how your platform is being abused by hostile foreign states or extremist groups to radicalize people, to promote hate. Like, why are you so resistant to listening? Why are you so resistant to opening up about it? Why are you so, like, do you not care about the society that allowed you to become a billionaire? Like, like, and also, like, sh like, surely if you want a legacy where people look at the name Mark Zuckerberg in awe rather than with disdain, like, d d like, don't you, like, d I don't know. I, I just, like, I can't put myself in his shoes because they, they do, you know, Facebook does so many fucked up things. When you look at, even after, like, I came out as a whistleblower, you know, the first thing that they did was ban me. I got banned on Facebook, and I also got banned on Instagram, right? Because they own Instagram. E even though they were the subjects of investigation, I was a witness to it, and they banned me. They try to blame me for, f for fuck-ups that happened on their platform when I'm the one that's actually reporting stuff to the authorities, when I'm the one that's actually, you know, trying to tell people about what's happened. And further... When you have, um, you know, senior executives at Facebook then hiring, like, right-wing PR firms, like Definers, to then seed the internet with completely made-up and untrue rumors and conspiracy theories about how the critics of Facebook are actually part of a George Soros, you know, in parentheses, uh, funded campaign you know, to shut down free speech, et cetera, where, which, which means that, you know, when I, you know, go and testify, for example, the European Union, right, I sit there testifying and there are people shouting Soros, Soros, Soros at me as I'm testifying. When I leave the European Parliament and somebody comes up and shouts Jew money at me, right, literally the conspiracy that they funded. Like, I just kind of, I go like, do you not, like, what on, what on earth made you think that that would be a good idea or helpful? Like, you know, it, you, you on one hand say we want to fight fake news and then you fund PR firms to create fake news about your critics. You know, and they finally admitted it. The New York Times did a whole expose on it and they finally admitted that they did that after they denied it, after they lied about it. Um, you know, and then, you know, you look at what happens when, you know, Mark Zuckerberg you know, literally wants Facebook to be everywhere and to be everything. And the problem is that you've got a company that's run by overconfident 
typically straight white dudes who sit in a position of privilege in California where everyone who works at this company is like a millionaire or about to become one and take a, a platform or a concept and plop it into a country like Myanmar, right? Never thinking about what happens when I put in place a system of rapid communication in a country that is currently experiencing ethnic tensions. Closed system as well. And when you look at what happened in Myanmar, where after Facebook, um, you know, entered the market, um, encouraged people uh, to use Facebook by subsidizing mobile phone data, where within a couple years, it became the top news source of the country. Like more than like conventional news, it's like people in Myanmar got their news from Facebook, right? So all of a sudden it becomes the primary source of news and hey ho, the military realizes that they could create a propaganda unit to attack Rohingya Muslims and spread hate messaging all through this platform and ignite tensions. And guess what? People died. Like tens of thousands of people died. And, you know, it's not me saying it. The United Nations said, you know, and warns Facebook about it, and then later said that they were a contributing factor to ethnic cleansing. And so, you know, to your question about, like, what would I say to Mark Zuckerberg, I kind of go, like, you know, ethnic cleansing. Like, what's, at what point will you take pause about what you're, this grand experiment that you're creating? Um, and I, I don't feel like it's greed because he has more than enough money. I, I really don't think it's greed. I think that he is so sure of himself that any notion of criticism must be wrong. And people just don't understand the brilliance of what he's building. But it's really fucked up. I should, have cl I should clarify as well, when I said closed system, I was referring to WhatsApp, which was used, I believe, quite heavily yeah. and had a contributing factor to what happened in Myanmar. Yeah, in Myanmar and also in Sri Lanka. Mm. Um, in, you know, uh, ethnic violence in India also. Um, and I just, I look at Mark Zuckerberg and all I see is just the, 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 the face of, you know, colonialism in the 21st century because he's going around, right, white dudes going around to the global south, making money off of people and not, and, and contributing to violence, to contributing to the erosion of social cohesion in a, in, a, in a country. And when there's a problem, just saying it's not my, it's not my fault, it's their, it's their fault, right? You know, but continuing to say, but I should be entitled to make money off of these people, if they go and kill themselves, well, it's not my fault, right? And I just go, like, this dude is a colonizer, um, you know, around the world, and I... I, I'm, I'm worried more so about countries in Africa or in South America or in Southeast Asia, which, unlike the United States or unlike Britain or unlike Europe, do not have um, the law enforcement capability or the civic institutions to even consider cybercrime, data protection, like all of these things which are very sort of, like nice to have in a comfy Western country. But actually, these are things that become even more important if you are in a place like Myanmar, where like violence can start like that. Um, and we're not talking about that. We're talking about Trump. We're talking about Brexit. We're talking about all these things. And it's like, actually, there's some really fucked up things that happen all around the world on these platforms. What do you think of Nick Clegg then? Because he's now a colleague of Mr. Zuckerberg. You mentioned him earlier. Yeah, um, yeah. Name two things that sold themselves out and were cool in 2010. <laughs> Nick Clegg, Mark Zuckerberg, right? Like it's like you've got the thing that I find so weird about Nick Clegg, and like I've met him tons of times because I worked at the Lib Dems for two years. Is like this is a guy who, back when Labour was in charge and proposed a national ID card system and a national ID database said like he would sooner be arrested and go to prison than be put into a national database. And he has moved from I will resist 
a national database of people to becoming the chief global apologist for like not just a national database but like the biggest like monitoring and surveillance system ever created in the history of humanity right like that is quite a that's quite a jump um but you know this is a guy that kind of has made his career on like selling out his values so i i'm i don't know what to say you know what we've spoken about over the course of this interview i think is terrifying but is it not true to say that if you don't want your data to be monetized without your permission if you don't want to be micro targeted by these adverts on social media platforms turn off the computer you don't want to be electrocuted don't use electricity turn off the lights right like you could say that about anything you know that i think and that's a that's a narrative that silicon valley really pumps out particularly at congress with their lobbyists which is like these are opt-in services like people we're not forcing people to use them like there's terms and conditions like if they don't like it they don't have to use it and it's like okay but like you know what job are you going to get if you say i don't want to be tracked by google right so therefore i'm not going to use google or any website that touches google you know what kind of social life are you going to have where you say i don't want to use facebook or instagram or or whatsapp right like if you if you take that argument it's like okay cool like you can say no right but ultimately these these platforms are so integrated now into like modern life that you're actually creating this like this sort of really nominal bullshit choice of like if you don't like society you can leave it right like it, it it's 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 bullshit. It's like the, your your option is like to become a hermit, you know, to not be tracked, to not you know, to not have your data misused. And also, the other thing that I'd say is that when you know, Silicon Valley to people, to citizens, or to politicians, or whatever, they'll often talk about what they do as a service, as a service, right? So, we provide a free service to people. And we, we make money through advertising and data and all that. But when you look at the job titles that people have in big tech companies, right? It's engineer and it's architect, right? It's not like customer service relations manager, right? It's engineer and it's architect. And when you, when you listen to how people who work in tech amongst themselves talk about what they're building. They, you know, they, they say, we're building an architecture, we're building an ecosystem, right? They don't, they don't say like we're, you know, we're, we're, we're creating some kind of service because not, they're not building a service. They're building an architecture. And when you, when you think about like, okay, imagine for a second that like Facebook was a building, right? If the digital architecture of Facebook was a physical architecture. And you walk into that building, and as you walk in, there's like a sign on the door that says, you agree to our terms and conditions. And you look and there's like, you know, a, a, a book, like outside of the building. And, and that you have to like flip through and read the book. And when you open the door, you're consenting to whatever's in that book. And you walk in, and then like, all of a sudden, like the doors close, and you're now in this like maze and the way the building works is like the more doors you have to open, the more like it powers itself, right? And so all of a sudden you're now put into a maze and mm, maybe there's not fire exits. Maybe it's confusing. Maybe you're trapped in there and you don't know how to leave and no one explains it or no one tells you what's actually happening or you're entering this room and it's actually a different room. You don't really know. Like we wouldn't go like, oh, well, if you don't want to like, if, you, if, if you're concerned about buildings that don't have fire exits, like, don't go into buildings without fire exits. Like, it would be like, like, what? No. Why are we allowing architects to build a building without fire exits? That's kind of, like, screwed up, right? We wouldn't say that. We'd say, like, no, just, like, that book outside is bullshit. You have to build a safe building, right? And it is about safety, right? When you look at the rise in, you know, mental ill health amongst young people, when you look at the rise in like mass school shootings in the United States, when you look at the rise in uh, racism online and online trolling behavior, when you look at like, you know, mass shootings, not just in the United States, but also like in Myanmar, right? Like ethnic tensions, ethnic cleansing, like this is a safety issue. Um, 
And we wouldn't say, well, if you don't like it, don't, 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 don't use it, if it was like a physical space, right? When you look at the history of building codes, it took a great fire in London before uh, you know, the state stepped in and said, actually, we're going to create minimum standards. It, may, it might be a private space, but we're going to create minimum standards of safety. And those are going to be design and engineering standards so that we don't have another great fire again, which, you know, the way you build your, your property may affect society in a significant way. And I really think that we're at a point now with the, the integration of, you know, the, the digital space with physical space that, like, we should start discussing, like, do we need a building code, you know, or a design code, which is enforced for building systems that aren't manipulative, that aren't, you know, sketchy, they don't stalk you, where just because there's something in terms and conditions that no one ever reads doesn't mean that they can do it, right? Having basic rules that we as a society say, you know what, you can make money off of the internet, but here's like some ground rules to not like fuck with people. Does this make you anxious? I'm anxious for where we are heading, like not just as a society, but like as almost like a species. Because when you look at, there's something very profound happening. Because when you look at, um, you know, t the, the evolution of, you know, digital devices and surveillance being now integrated into like your homes, people are just starting to put like Alexa into their homes, right? And you and people talk about it as like something, it sounds like kind of nice, like the internet of things. Like it sounds sort of wonky and wonderful. Like, oh, it's the internet of things. But actually, if you imagine sort of 10, 20 years down the road where the internet of things is sort of like the norm now, right? Where y y when you watch TV, your TV watches you, right? Doors are also the doorman. Right when when and and when you sit in the living room as like everything in the room watches you and thinks about you and talks to each other about you, where you sit there, and your refrigerator is talking to your phone or your device or your TV about like what should we recommend that this person eats and what's available or not available at the grocery store or where you know your 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 self driving car talks to the road in your office about whether or not you should be on time depending on your subscription package. And all of a sudden, being a human for the first time means that you live inside of something that knows about you. And there's something quite profound about like, no longer, no longer living in a passive environment, which yes, affects you, but doesn't think about you. Where, where all of a sudden, for the first time in human history, we live in an environment which is motivated where the building has an agenda, like where your TV has an agenda, where your phone has an agenda. And that agenda is to optimize how you think and how you behave, what you eat, who you talk to, who you don't talk to, what you see and what you don't see, not just like on your phone or your device, but now in buildings, at work, in your car, on the tube, everywhere. And when you think about how like scary it is the idea that you can live in an environment where it watches you thinks about you judges you seeks to influence your behavior where it can see you but you can't see it and like the only thing that i can think of where we have a similar explanation is when people talk about like spirits or divinity or curses or things like that that you know if you're religious, this idea that there's something that constantly watches you, judges you, seeks to influence your behavior on an, in accordance with a, a, a set of rules that is laid out for you. And if you do well, it rewards you. And if you violate those rules, it punishes you. Well, that's like pervasive AI systems. And I don't really want to live in a world where something that's spirit-like or god-like is at the control of somebody like Mark Zuckerberg, who, when warned about ethnic cleansing, doesn't do anything. Whose, whose moral code is, I'm right because I know I'm right, 
and any criticism, you know, is like, I'm not going to listen. And to give somebody like that, that kind of power, I find kind of scary. And, you know, I'm not talking about tomorrow or next week, but like we are on a clear path of integration with AI and a clear path of integration with tech and a clear integration, you know, with surveillance. And, you know, your phone is a surveillance device, you know, and soon like your refrigerator is going to become a surveillance device. Outside of my flat, there's an ad for an AI enabled toothbrush that then sends data about your brushing habits back to like some, I don't know, Oral-B or something, right? Okay, cool. So that, like, literally my toothbrush now monitors me. Everything, like what next? Your toilet, you take a shit and it analyzes you and then talks to your refrigerator. I don't want to live in an environment where I don't know what is, what is watching me, what isn't watching me, what's thinking about me. And like when I see something, when I see something on TV or when I go into a shop and I see a sale or I see something recommended to me, like why, where I don't know why I'm seeing that. And, that, and that somebody else who has an agenda to influence how I behave, you know, uh, has the ability to, to filter my, like, entire life. And, like, when you think about, you know, the, 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 the role of privacy, you know, people often will say to me, like, well, okay, well, I don't have anything to hide. Like, who cares? Whatever. And I just go, yeah, but... Like, who you were 10 years ago, when you were, like, 12 versus 22 versus 32 versus 42, right? You were different people. And the only way that you can evolve and grow as a person on your own terms is through privacy. Because you get to control the information about yourself in different circumstances. So you can be who you want to be with your parents versus with your friends versus with your spouse or lover versus, you know, with, like, your boss right? Or your coworkers. And the only thing that allows you to be in charge of that is privacy. And there's also a process of collective forgetting that you benefit from. You know, your boss doesn't necessarily remember or know what you did or what you said 10 years ago, right? But now we're like creating a society where like we can't even forget anything. Like you literally take pictures of your food, right? Your that avocado toast that you had three years ago is still in a memory somewhere. And like we're creating a society now where we can't even like we don't know how to forget anymore. And that's where we and, and, and what happens when, you know, you make a mistake or you screw up and you whatever. Let's say you're a kid and you steal something from the shop, right? And the shop, which now is watching you, remembers that. And the shop now talks to everybody else, all the other shops, all in your city. And then you get a, a, a profile which says, you're a high risk at stealing. And it remembers that forever. So when you then try to go shopping 10 years later, the door won't open because the door recognizes you and says, ah, oh, no, I know that you are somebody who's probably gonna steal something. So all of a sudden, I'm not gonna let you in. You try to have a job interview and the door won't open, right? Like we're literally, that, that's what, that could happen. And it sounds kind of Orwellian and scary and like maybe far-fetched, but if you think about it, imagine, you know, imagine you're like Macy's or John Lewis or whatever, right? And you have a security system and it goes, you know, we've been able to prevent, you know, X number of shoplifting incidents because we just don't open the doors, right? Well, you might try doing that. But then imagine if every, every other building does that. How are you gonna get a job? How are, you gonna live, how are you gonna move on? How are you gonna curate yourself to become something new, right? You're no longer in charge. Literally, the buildings have more power than you do about your own life. And I think that that is kind of freaky. It is. Chris Wiley, thank you. Cheers, thank you.